is chapter number six. I want to rehearse a couple of things. Uh, we found a lot of complaining going on in the last of chapter number five. Uh, but, you know, in chapter five, verse number one, if you look at that just for a moment, it said, and afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord God of Israel. <laughs> Moses told, told Pharaoh exactly what he wanted him to tell him. So he told him exactly, and then the Bible said in the last part of uh, chapter number four, verse number 31, and the people believe, so everybody's excited, and now they think they're going to get delivered. You know, you don't always get delivered when you want to get delivered. You get delivered when God allows you to be delivered. And so we had a lot of complaining that, that went on. They bowed their heads. They worshiped God. Boy, everything was going. God, God told Moses exactly, though, what was going to happen in chapter number 3 and verse number 19. Let me just read it to you. God told him on Mount Sinai, he said, and I'm sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, no, by a mighty hand. You know, they forgot what God told them. You know, sometimes we, we hear what we want to hear. Somebody can say a whole lot of things and we kind of cherry pick what we like. Moses said, hey, praise God, I'm going to go down and deliver them. He showed all the signs to Israel. They believed God bowed their head and worshiped. So he walks into Pharaoh and he tells Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord God, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey him? That, hey, this ungodly crowd, you need to understand, there comes a time when even a nation becomes reprobate. They know all they, they know all about God. They don't know anything about God. All right. They think they know, you know, we we have a generation growing up that thinks that they have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, that, whatever the parents tell them, they, they just, oh well, we we do that different, you know, times have changed, all this stuff going on. Folks, let me tell you, you can still listen to what the father said and gain from it. But they think they've got to rethink it. They call themselves free thinkers, and yet they're not free thinkers. They believe just exactly what everybody tells them that they need to be believing. They just don't want to believe the right things. So what happened was God told him, you go tell them, but he said he's not going to let you go. So what happened when he went in and told them? He didn't let them go. He just increased the bondage on them in chapter number five. He took the straw away, said, now you're going to have to go out, find your own straw. So they're now, instead of getting the straw, making the brick, they needed the clay, they needed the water, they needed the straw. They had big pits that they had, and what they did, they put that clay in there, mixed it with water to thin it down a little bit, then started putting the straw in, mashed that straw in, took it out, put it in, little forms just like we would do and started burn they had to burn that brick to harden that clay back up again now they're doing twice as much work things deteriorated what happened when moses was on the way back the elders met him and said it's your fault <laughs> moses went to god and told god you didn't let them go god's already told him he, hey he's already said that he's going to have to do this in a little different manner, all right? So we find that he said he'd do what he's going to do. What's he going to do? Look at verse number 1 of chapter 6. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. Sometimes God's got to do something to the unsaved. Uh, one of these days, all of this that we know is going to come to pass now, let me tell you something. America is going to run <coughs> their head against the brick wall, friend. Pharaoh, I said, was the immovable object, and God was the irresistible force. And when the irresistible force meets the immovable object, you have immeasurable heat. That's the result of that thing. So we got one city not going to move, one city is. But I've got news. That immovable object is going to move. Look at verse 1. For with a strong hand shall he let them go, 
and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. Now, he said he's not only going to let them go, he's going to throw you out. Before God gets done, he's going to throw these people out. He's going to tell them, hey, you just pack up your stuff, you take everything you've got, they spoil the Egyptians, they take all their gold and silver and everything else before they go. Pharaoh's going to throw them out. So God said, you just hang around a little bit and see what I do unto him. Now, in verse number two, God spake unto Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. We're going to find in chapter six that five times God's going to use that phrase. God, God keeps reiterating to Moses who he is. Who's on your side? If the Lord be for us, who can be against us? God be for us. Listen, if God's on your side, I've often said that you and God make a multitude, make a, make a uh, uh, not a multitude, make a majority, all right? Anywhere you go, you're going to make a majority with God. So what he does, he reiterates to Moses, he said, hey, I'm the Lord. You need to know who I am. Look at verse number three. I appeared unto Abraham. I appeared unto Isaac. Now, I'm going to use those words with each one of these because in your English structure, it's something that is unspoken, all right? It's something that you understand. He just simply said, I appeared to Abraham. I appeared to Isaac. I appeared unto Jacob. I appeared to all of these. I, now, I've appeared unto you. Now, you look back at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What did God do? He delivered every one of them. Sometimes it took a period of time before he did that, but God has to get things right in a lot of different areas. But he said, I'm the Lord. He said, I appeared unto them. But he said, by the name of God Almighty. He uses the term God Almighty. God Almighty just simply means God can do anything, anytime, anywhere. God's not limited. So what Pharaoh has done has not limited God's ability one bit. Listen, you don't change God's mind. You don't change God's methods. You don't change what God does. God's mind is set, and you're not going to change his mind. His purposes will come to pass. And he just said, I came to them as the God that could do anything. He had to do that for Abraham. He was beyond the age of fathering a child, and she was beyond the age of conceiving a child, and God opened his loins and opened her womb and brought forth what he said in Genesis chapter number uh, 12 and 15 and 17 that he was going to do. God told him, I'm going to give you a seed from Sarah. You see, Hagar was never on God's agenda. Hagar, Abraham, listened to his wife. They use the terminology that he just simply listened to her. Same thing that Adam did. And he got out of the will of God with it. And God did what he said. With Isaac, he did the same thing. He had to open a womb. He had to give the right child. He did that with Jacob. So we find each time, he said, I appeared to them as God Almighty. But by my name, Jehovah, was I not known to them. What Jehovah established, what, what does that mean? Jehovah means to exist, but it also means to continue to exist in a presence. From one generation to the other, God's never changed. From Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21, uh, 20, uh, 20, uh, God's never changed. You need to understand. I'm going to deal with that probably one night again in Hebrews. Jesus Christ the same. God the same. So he's telling them for the first time, see, they, the Old Testament believers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, knew him by the name Yahweh. Yahweh is the Old Testament name for Jehovah God, and they, they knew him by that name. Matter of fact, it was a name that they did not speak, and it was a name that generally they did not teach their children. The reason being, they knew that if they took that name in vain, that God would deal with them. You didn't take that name lightly. But now he's going to be known to Israel as Jehovah God, or the self-existing one. The word Jehovah is always used in, in what we call emphatic, all right? 
It's not something that God puts out for debate. It's something that God says is a fact that exists. When you say something emphatically, uh, you may tell a child, I don't want you to do something. And the child says, well, I'm going to do it anyway. And you look at them and you said, I said, no. When you put that emphasis on that word, that word becomes emphatic, all right? You're telling them it's not to be argued with, not to be debated, not to be discussed, that from now on, they're going to know me by that unchangeable, self-existing uh, word, Jehovah God. He said, I wasn't known to them. But he said, I've also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. Now, What's he going to do with Israel? When he brings Israel out, he brings them out to take them in. They died in the wilderness out of the will of God. They didn't have to do that. They sent 12 spies out, 10 brought an evil report. Joshua and Caleb, hey, they said it is a land of giants, but it's a good land and we can take that land. God told them, and what's called the Palestinian covenant. That's found over in chapter 12 of the book of Genesis, where God told Abraham, every place that your sole of your foot has touched. Now, where did, where did he do that? He crossed the Euphrates, Euphrates River in the north. That's up in what they call Mesopotamia. Today, you, I, you've got uh, Iraq, and you've got Afghanistan, you've got all these... Uh, places Turkey up in that area. It's what's called the Fertile Crescent. Up in there you've got the Euphrates River. We're going to be dealing with that uh, probably I think tonight in Revelation where God is going to drive that thing up. But at the same time from there all the way down into Canaan all the way around to the Nile River into Egypt Abraham walked. That's what's called the Palestinian Covenant. That land that they're setting in this morning over there, that, is, that does not belong to the Arabs, folks. That is God's people's land. He gave that to them. That's why they're fighting for their life and every inch of it over there. The Golan Heights, uh, all of this. Listen, Gaza Strip down to the south. They're battling about for these places over there because God gave it to them. He's moving them back there again. But what he said was, he said that he was going to establish, he established a covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan. So he's going to bring them out. To give them the land means he's going to make sure that they defeat the enemies within the land. These are promises of God. So he said, I'm going to, I'm going to bring them out to take them in. He called it the land of their pil pilgrimage. I like that. That main pilgrim is somebody who lives someplace but doesn't belong. Abraham was the first Hebrew. What's a Hebrew pilgrim? He was the first one. He came down. God promised them all that land. <clears throat> but the Bible said he never dwelled in a city. He dwelled in tents. But the Bible said he looked for a city whose foundation, who was foundations whose builder and maker was God. He was looking for a different city. You ever seen a city with foundations under it? Nobody else had either. He's looking for that new Jerusalem that comes down. He's looking for that city one of these days, and he was prophetic of it. But he said, I made them a, a, a establish my covenant to give them the land of their pilgrimage wherein they were strangers. Verse 5, and I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel whom the Egyptians not kept in bondage but continue to keep in bondage. He hears them. Sometimes when we cry to God, we think God's ears uh, don't hear. Listen, he said, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Uh, the Bible said God's ear is always toward his children. God hears uh, a lot of times when we cry out, we think God doesn't hear. God hears, and he hears them, and he knows that the bondage has gotten harder. But notice what he said in verse 5, I have remembered my covenant. What was the covenant? God told them, I'm going to bring you out of there. So God remembers. You don't, sometimes I remind God of what he said. <clears throat> Nothing wrong with that. 
I tell God, Lord, you said this and you said that. God knows what he said. But I want God to understand that I know what God said also. I'm not telling him for his benefit. I'm telling God for my benefit that I understand what God said. And I still believe that God will bring some things to pass that sometimes are a little bit slow developing. But God's still able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. According to the power that worketh in us, what is that power according to all that we ask? It's the power of prayer. So we find here, he said, I remember them. Now, this is what I want you to do. Verse 6, wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord. Now, we're going to find in here seven I wills. And the next, this this is not dependent upon man. When God said, I will do something, that's not dependent upon you and I at that point in time. That's a covenant that God's going to make with them. And he starts out in verse number six, I will bring you out from under the burdens of Egypt. You're not going to be slaves for long. You just hold on a little bit. God's going to deliver you. I will bring you out. He didn't say Moses would bring you out. Abram would bring you out. He didn't say anybody would bring you out. God, matter of fact, the Bible says later in Exodus that God brought them out with a high hand. That made better their hands were up. They were praising God. He brought them out with power. And that's what he, so he starts the I wills. But he said, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Then he said, I'll rid you out of their bondage. You'll no longer be slaves. You're going to be freed men. Free to make your own life choices. It, isn't, that, isn't that a wonderful thing? I said not long ago that freedom is an, a contraction of two words, free and doom. It means that you are free to choose your destiny or your doom or even your death. Uh, we live where in America, thank God, you, hey, if you want to smoke yourself to death, you go ahead. If you want to drink yourself to death, you go ahead. If you want to eat yourself to death, go ahead. If you're diabetic and you want to eat nothing but ice cream seven days a week, you help yourself. You can do that. We went out to eat the other day, and there was a lady came by us. She was a 500-pounder. And when she came, two other 500-pounders just like her. Came down, one of them looked like old of me, the other brother, the other looked, but they looked like triplets. And I told Barbara, you know, my mother used to say, you dig your grave with your teeth. You dig your grave with your teeth. And it come back to God. You know what? They're free to do that. Somewhere down the line, somebody's going to have to feed them. Probably already are. I'd hate to see them working at Walmart distribution throwing freight on the line, all right? I, I, I'd hate to see them having to do that at this point in time in life. But freedom means that you're free now to choose your own destiny, your own future, be it good or bad. Now, what do choices have? Choices have consequences. They've got consequences, good or bad. Every choice we make is going to have a consequence, and sometimes we look beyond the consequence, and we just, we just put our mind on the choices, not knowing that down the road someplace you're going to pay a price. There's a price to be paid. I tell these young people and I tell the older people, you take care of yourself because your body is going to have to carry you a long way. And one of these days it will fail you when you fail it. That's just... I'm, I try to keep my weight down. It's a hard thing. Oh, I've done, been there and done that. Isn't it a terrible thing, amen, to try to, to, to try to, you just like stuff, all right? And I've liked stuff all my life. And it, that's what it is. He just said this. He said, I'm going to rid you of the bondage. You're not going to be, you're not going to be a slave any longer to what somebody else tells you. One thing I still thank God for America, and this thing's closing down a little bit, but we still have freedom. The other day we were going in a place, that, you know, they got wearing mask signs everywhere. And you're in South Carolina. Barbara said, I need one. I said, this is South Carolina. Walked in, everybody's in now. Nobody got a mask on. The people that do wear them got them down under here. And, and, and that's okay. I'm all right with that, okay? I don't have any problem with that. I'm not a big mask guy. Uh, Barbara can't breathe and she, she cheats. 
she holds hers out so she can breathe out from under that under that mat. I don't know if they help. I heard. I guess if you got something, you got to call for them. Wear one. Uh, Seems like all the states up here that are uh, really heavy on the masking thing are the ones where you know this COVID's eating them alive up there. So I don't see where it's helping them. But listen, freedom. Just get off of the politics of it. He said, "I'll rid you of your bondage." Then he said, I'll redeem you with a stretched out arm. He said, I'm going to bring you out with great judgments. How's he, how's he going to get Pharaoh to turn these people loose? I'm going to tell you how he's going to get to it. He's going to put so much pressure on him. You know, I kind of feel sorry for Joe Biden. He's now sitting in the seat that Donald Trump sat in for four years. You talk about pressure, folks. It's I'm telling you, everybody, I watch these men, I watch George H. Bush and, and uh, uh, George W. Bush and uh, uh, Barack Obama and all these. You look at them when they went into the presidency and then you look at the color of their hair when they came out. They went in dark hair and came out snow white. The pressure of that office, and it is... A horrendous thing, that pressure of that office, where you've got all of these voices clamoring at you uh, with what they want you to do and everything else. Now, notice what he said. I'm going to redeem you with a stretched out arm. How? With great judgments. How do you change the mind of the wicked? Sometimes you've got to put a lot of pressure on them. He's going to bring them out with a strong arm. Now, so we see three I wills there. Look at verse 7. And I will take you to me for a people. You're going to be my peculiar treasure. What is Israel today? That is the apple of God's eye sitting over there. Now, when we see them, uh, we see them, they've, they've rejected Christ. And I, 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 I like to sit down a lot of times. I don't know about you. I use uh, this Google Earth. Anybody use that? Man, I go to foreign lands. I sat down right in front of the place where I served in Germany and different places around. Every time a missionary sends their house, their home address, I go look at their house. I'm just proud for them. I see their car sitting in their park in, in front of the house. You know, every time I look at their house, their car's <coughs> parked in front of their house. I, I'm going to have to question them about that. It's, uh, it's always sitting in front of the house when, when I go and sit out in front of them. But notice what he said. He said, I'm going to take you to be for a people. Those are God's people over there. They may be out of the will of God. They're still God's people. Nothing on earth is going to change that. God will never forsake Israel. He's going to put some pressure on them in the tribulation period, but they're going to be it. So he said, yeah, I'll bring you out. I'll rid you of bondage. I'll redeem you. Then he said, I will take you to me for a people. That word, take you to me, I think, uh, you know, 52 years ago, I took Barbara Lynn to be my wife. I took her to be me. I told her the other day, I just told her, we've had a good life together. And we really have. We, we've had a good life. <clears throat> had her ups and downs like everybody else. And I tell people, if you stay through the ups and downs, and one of these days you'll end up with something better than you thought you could ever have anyway. And we got something good going on. I, t I took her. Now, when I took her, I took her to keep her. You say, why? Well, she's a keeper, right? Huh? She's a keeper. She's not one of them little, little bitty, uh, what do they call them, crappy down in the south. They're about this long. I, we catch a big slab crappie uh, out of Kentucky Lake. You can't keep anything under 11 inches or 12 inches. They've got, they've got to be a foot long before you can keep those things. So he said, you're a keeper, and I'm going to keep you. But look what he said. <clears throat> and I will be to you a God. That's interesting. He used a capital G, but he did not use the definite uh, article V. You've got what's called a definite article. You've got what's called an indefinite article. A means one of many. <clears throat> v means one of a kind. There were times when they would forsake him for the gods. But he would never forsake them. 
That's an interesting thing. He used an indefinite article. I believe every word of God is pure. That's what the Bible says. People say, why do you believe all that? Man? Come, I just believe what the Bible says. I learned a long time ago, uh, you believe man belongs, he believes the Bible. If he quits believing the Bible, then you believe the Bible. You'll do well, and he's not going to. There's going to be some issues with it. He used the indefinite article that I will be to you a God that tells me there's going to be times when they may forsake him. What about you and I? He made a covenant with us the same way. He said we'd be to them a peculiar people. Once you get saved, you're what? You're secure, folks. It's over. It's done. And I want to say this in the right manner. There is nothing in this world that you can do that will separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Amen. I thank God. You talk about a forgiving God. If we were half as forgiving as God was, we'd be in pretty good shape. God puts up with a whole lot with you and I, right? I look in the mirror every morning. Guess what I see? I see somebody I don't like. Now, you may look in there and say, man, look at me this morning. I don't look to see what I look like as far as my as features. I, I brush my teeth. I shave my face every morning. I comb my hair and I clean my ears and I shave my ears with electric razors. You get older, you'll have to do it too. Your hair goes underground and go, <laughs> it just comes out your nose and your ears and your back and try to, Barbara has to trim my ears. Now she's looking and say, what are you talking about? Hey, hey, I'm just saying this. I don't care what I look like. I try to be presentable. First thing I do in the morning is shower and put the odor on, shave and clean up. And somebody said, well, you clean up pretty good. I try to clean up pretty good. But what I don't like is what I see when I look in my eyes. Have you ever stood in the mirror and looked into the pupil of your own eye? To see what manner of man, to see what manner of woman you are, to see if God is pleased with what and who you are. I try to do that every morning. I look at not the blue of my eyes, but I try to look into that inner side. And it's a time of self-examination early in the morning to where you say, what am I? Lord, I ask God a lot of times, why do you love me? I do not understand that. Why did you save me? I do not understand that because I know who I am. Now, he says to them, I'm going to be a God. But notice what he said after that, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. Now, he said, I'm going to be to you a God. There's going to be times you forsake me, but you're going to understand uh, generally that I am the Lord your God. I am in charge. As a child of God, you're going to find out who's in charge. You think, well, I'm in charge of my life. No, you're not either. I heard a man say one time, why should he bless the food that he worked to put on a table. <clears throat> never forget, never forget when he said that. His mother, a good godly woman, asked him to bless the food. And, and he said, why? He said that to his mama. Why should I thank God for what I work for? And I thought myself, God gave you the strength. God gave you the opportunity. God gave you the job. God can take everything you got away from you anytime God wants you and puts you flat. And a man one time tell me I'm not afraid of death. He's out of the will of God. He said, I'm not afraid of dying. I looked at him and I said, there's some things a whole lot worse than dying. God might just let you live. <laughs> hey, you think about that one for a little while. Now, notice what he said. He said, I'll take you to me for a people, and I'll be a God to you, but I'll always be the Lord your God, even when I'm not the God of your life, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of Egyptian. Now, we find another one, and I will. Verse number 8, And I will bring you in unto the land concerning the which I did swear to give it to Abraham, I swore to give it to Isaac, swore to give it to Jacob. I'm going to bring you in. Now, when he brings you in, God's not going to fight every battle for you. Sometimes we expect God to do everything. God expects you to do some things. He said, I'm not going to fight every... I'm, listen, sometimes you're going to have to man up 
and just fight some of these things and and in your life and you're going to have to get a hold of them nobody else can do that for you and god said hey he said i'm going to bring you into the land not going to give it to you but i'll tell you one thing he said you're going to fight for that thing for every inch of it you're going to bet you know why people are in the shape they are? Because most of the young people in our nation have never paid any price for where they are. They've never served in the military. They've never paid anything. Everything's been handed to them. I, I blame us parents for a lot of that because we always want our children to have it better than we had it. And we give them things without them ever having to do anything to earn those things. And you find a lack of responsibility. Everybody, you know, now the, I think they're trying to forgive all of the college debt. I never got one dime from the government for college, secular college, Bible college, uh, graduate work or anything else. Never, I've never got a penny from anybody. <clears throat> they told me, you go to work. You go to work, you pay it. They say, well, you don't understand how expensive it is now. You don't understand how much, how little we made. We didn't make big money back in the, those days. Everything today is, uh, it, it belongs to you by default because you were born in this nation. You know, my God, I thank God for my dad. My, my dad told me, he said, nobody owes you anything, son except for an opportunity to go out and work a job and earn a living. That's what, that's what this nation owes you, an opportunity to go out and labor. It's going to be hard. Now, he's going to, he said another I will in verse 8, I'll give it to you for an heritage. I am the Lord. Could God not have driven that crowd out? Now, he helped. He said, I've sent my hornet in front of you, son. I found out whether them hornets will move you. <laughs> I have dealt with hornets. I've fought. I'm not going to go into that story again, but I'll tell you what. I fired my cannons till the guns melted down, and son, I didn't have an alligator to fight another round with. I had to run <laughs> from that point. I know of two rednecks that shot a hornet's nest that big around, shot it with a shotgun. Needless to say, they could not outrun what came after them. Though. They couldn't get away from it. Hornets, God helped them out. God made walls fall down. God, boy, God did all types of things. This made the sun stand still and the moon to stand still. He did all these things to help them. But there's going to be battles now. Why is he saying that? Listen, he said, I'm going to rid you from your bondage, but you're going to have some problems until I do. I'll give it to you for an heritage. All right, let's go to verse 9. We're going to close down real quick. And Moses spake so unto the children of Israel, but they hearkened not unto Moses for anguish of spirit and for cruel bondage. Now he's trying to lead them out. God told him what God's going to do, what he's going to do to Pharaoh, what he's going to do to everybody. God done told him to go back and tell them, but they're not listening now. Sometimes you're going to find out in life you're going to have to go it on your own. Though none go with me, still I will follow. You ever thought about that? What happens when everybody forsakes you? You just got to keep on following. So now Moses is going to have to do what God told him to do, but ain't nobody on his side now. He's going to catch it from Pharaoh. And friend, every time he does something, the children of Israel are going to let him know they're paying a higher price for it down the road. God has put him in a place of leadership. And in that place of leadership, sometimes you have to do things that people don't like, don't understand, or anything else, and you just got to do what you've got to do at that point. But I find it very interesting, the I wills in here. Father, we love you. We thank you for the day. Pray now, Father, you bless the service to come. Give us a good day today. And Lord, we love you. You've been good to us. Lord, I just pray for our people. Pray for Janet this morning. I pray for Brother Harold this morning. 
Pray for our nation again that God would help them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, go on to the prayer room.